I want Aboriginal people to really jump on the on the boat, I guess, in, in that sense, and start to look at what they can harvest in their in their um, countries and and you know sell the restaurants and tell their story. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Australia has some of the most extraordinary native ingredients on the planet. While the original holders of our land explored native ingredients for tens of thousands of years, acceptance of native ingredients has only been quite recent. There was a cultural cringe towards native ingredients spawned by a generation of chefs who tried to use these ingredients without understanding how they were used for thousands of years, which is to say in the 80s and 90s, no one knew what they were doing. But things have changed. Daniel Motlop is the co-owner of Something Wild, Native Co and Seven Seasons. Daniel, how are you going? Good, mate. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for joining us. We've got a lot to explore. Um, you've had um, multiple amazing careers and at the moment very, very much devoted to native ingredients and um, ac- across restaurants and for consumers. Um, but take us back to the early days when you were when you were a kid. What was food like for you growing up? Yeah, I suppose just the the family gatherings and um, you know out hunting and and eating on the fire that sort of stuff was was a pretty big family occasion. Um, you know, Darwin is really Asian influenced, I guess. Um, the way we eat, um, the way we share our culture, I guess too. So um, yeah, always. There's always rice on the table um, as part of that, probably every night. Um, whenever there was a roast, I even wanted rice. So rice was a big big food in, in that sense. But then also you had, you know, the hunting side of the magpie goose, you know, going out getting turtle, um, you know, buffalo, um, fish, things like that. So pretty lucky to be brought up with that lifestyle um, along with the gathering side, I guess, of um, eating things that are plentiful, within the Darwin region and Northern Territory on the trees. Um, You know, we always had tamarind. We always had uh, bush apples, kakadu plums, things like that that just grew naturally up there. So very lucky place to grow up in. Magpie goose is an extraordinary eating experience, but it's not available uh, to many in Australia. And you just listed some incredible uh, native ingredients as well. What's what's your memories of being young and... and, um, seeing those being cooked and, and treated? Yeah, I suppose it, it was a big occasion, you know, waking up early in the morning, heading out bush and um, going to get some, some goose, I guess. And just the experience of sitting there and the smell of um, paper bark and, you know, the, the dew um, and then the birds just, you know, honking away in, in the swamp. Um, everyone sort of sitting around waiting and, yeah, and then it sort of the sun comes up and the, the, the magpie goose lift and you've got about an hour of shooting when they they move out of the the swamp and you know it's it's it was pretty pretty entertaining up upbringing i guess um and then obviously the the cooking side of it um you know the process of of um plucking the goose and and doing the gutting all that sort of stuff and then putting it straight on a fire you know yeah, you just that the, up, the upbringing of the smell and and everything in in the air, I guess, in that on the morning and in the afternoon. Something uh, wild has had an amazing influence on our understanding and use of native ingredients in Australia, and I want to dig deep into that shortly. But um, you you built an amazing career as an AFL footballer. Um, tell us about that period of time uh, in your life and and what impact it had on you. Yeah, I think it it just gave me a really good base to what I want to do um, in life. You know, I, you know. sometimes I wish I didn't do it and I got into, um, you know, the food side earlier in, in life. Um, but, um, you know, it was, it was a great experience for where I am, am now. Um, and as, you know, I wouldn't say successful, but I feel like I've, I've become successful in, in what I do because of that footy career and, moving away from home at a, a young age and, you know, dad putting me on a plane and saying, if you want to make something of yourself and then you have to go down and move down south and try to get drafted, which I was lucky enough to do after six months and in in living in Adelaide and got drafted over to North Melbourne and then Port Adelaide. So, yeah, pretty pretty lucky to um, do that. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was a 
it was a battle to move away from home at the same time and leave, you know, that culture culture behind. Well, tell us about that period and, and what it was like leaving that culture behind and immersing yourself in, in that football world. What were the challenges that you had? Yeah, I suppose it, a lot of the challenge was um, the stereotype, I guess, when I moved it because Darwin's so multicultural and, um, you know, they, they, there's no racism. There's, everyone lives together and it's a it's a pretty different lifestyle, I guess, in that sense. Very respectful in everyone's culture. Um, you know, you had Greek people, you had Italians, you know, Asians, as I said before. Um, and, yeah, just very, very good upbringing uh, we had and, very lucky and then moving down down south and being in a football environment that is you know very stereotypical I guess and um in in who I was and yeah just trying to overcome that I guess and and learn more about um myself and and you know the lifestyle down south you mentioned that you wish you got into the food industry earlier sometimes um, but your influence has been incredible in 2016 you and your father and brothers um, started something wild tell, tell us about the early days and 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 why that why that was created yeah you know, I moved up to Darwin to um, I suppose over my whole footy career everyone and all Darwin boys and Darwin families all talked about about selling magpie goose um, to restaurants you know we wondered why how come no one no one ever tried to do it i guess um you know what it's obviously a good source of food and um it could provide an income for for communities i guess if if aboriginal people sold it um and that was really the the driving force of it um you know i went back to darwin and become the chief minister's advisor after a few different jobs trying to work out my lifestyle and where i wanted to be after footy and yeah, end up starting a business, and Renee Redzepi and Jocks from Frello uh, come up to Darwin, and I was just a, a harvester at that stage of wild native ingredients, and I showed them a few things around around the Northern Territory that they could use on on a pop up in Sydney, um, or Renee's pop up in um, Noma, and lucky enough to you know send a lot of stuff, and I suppose I, I felt as though. Um, as a young Aboriginal harvester, I was getting ripped off, I think, in, in what I was doing and the, and the time spent harvesting and getting magpie goose, trying to start that um, that business was really hard. So I, we were selling into something wild at the time, which was a small business, and we thought, as a family, we thought, you know, let's, let's buy something wild and actually, you know, do, do the whole way through, you know, from harvesting um, to plate, I guess, and selling out of a at a retail shop in the central market, so we actually did that, and I suppose it snowballed from there. Um, you know, the th- things like green ants. Um, you know, we started green ants, um, harvesting green ants before anyone, and e- everyone sort of tries to do it now, I guess. And we've worked out ways how to how to really make that sustainable, and it's taken you know three or four years. So I feel as though we've changed the game in the, in that sense. Um, we are. Um, a very, as a business, we, we wild harvest a lot. 